like to take the opportunity of welcoming everyone here this afternoon. Very pleased you've come, and we trust that God will bless you for being here. Um, hymn number two we're going to sing now. Jesus, my Saviour, to Bethlehem came, laid in a manger to sorrow and shame. Oh, what was wonderful, blessed be his name, seeking for me, for me. And then the second verse says, Jesus, my Saviour, on Calvary's tree, paid the great debt and my soul he set free. Oh, it was wonderful, how could it be, dying for me, for me. And then we have it's coming to earth, verse 1. Coming to the cross, verse 2, and then we have his future coming. In verse 3, Jesus, my Saviour, shall come from on high. Sweet is the promise as weary years fly. Oh, I shall see him descending the sky, coming for me, for me. Hymn number 2, we'll just remain seated. Jesus, my Saviour, to Bethlehem Again, we extend to everyone a very, very warm welcome and trust that you'll be blessed for being here. There's some announcements you might remember. Our speaker today is Andrew, Andrew Barber. And then next Lord's Day at the same time at 3.30, we'll have Alistair Carswell in the will of God from Waringstown alone to preach the gospel. Then on Thursday night this week at 8 p.m. the prayer meeting and the Bible reading, and um, we're going into Esther chapter 7. Very interesting book. Everyone's welcome to come along to that meeting as well. Then next Lord's Day at 2.30 is the Sunday School for the boys and girls. And then at 3 p.m. is the prayer meeting and the gospel at 3.30, as we have mentioned. Now, just before we commend ourselves to God, there are usually some names that we mention that would appreciate prayer, families and people that are not well. And we'll not mention them all, there's quite a list, but um, we'll mention Sam McAtee, who would normally be here, May Farr, uh, Jim McNew in the hospital in Lurgan there, uh, Jonathan Aiken, uh, and Robert Crutchley. And then there are those families that have suffered the loss of a loved one through the week, and we... Uh, Feel for them as well, and we would ask you to remember them in your prayers. There's the McVeigh family, the McCaffrey family, and the Cousins and Holmes family. Um, all have suffered bereavement this week, and they be assured that they are in our prayers. We'll just commend ourselves to God before Andrew gets up to speak. 
Our Father, we come humbly into thy holy presence once more in the precious and worthy name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thankful again, our Father, for the tremendous access we have into the presence of God. Our voice heard upon earth, but our prayers heard in the courts of heaven itself. We thank thee for this access that has been won for us by the person of thy well-beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, one who came, one who went to a cross, suffered, bled and died in a room instead, made a way back to God from the dark paths of sin, and one whom we have been singing about, that one day will come and receive his waiting people to himself. In the meantime, our Father, we're thankful that we are still in the day of grace. Thou art still calling out from among the nations a people for thy name. One here, another there, are putting their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing sins forgiven, made fit for heaven itself, and are able to go on their way rejoicing. We acknowledge freely, our Father, this is a work of thyself. No man could accomplish such a thing, but thou art a God who is able, willing, and ready to save. We can echo the words of the psalmist, the God that is our God is a God of salvation. We'd ask thee to remember this meeting that lies before us. Pray for Andrew, that will give him the help that's needed, give him clarity of thought and mind, and may, may he be able to make much of the person of thy well-beloved son. And as we pray for the speaker, we pray for the hearer alike. We pray, our God, that thou will give them ears to hear, hearts to understand. And we pray, our God, that even today some will take true ground before thee, turn from sin, and turn to the only one that can meet their need, and one can fit them for heaven's glory and salvation. We look to thee, our Father. We not be unmindful of these names that have been mentioned. Some are sick, some are sorrowing. Thou knowest about each and every one, and we bring them before thee, the great God of all comfort, and we ask thee, our God, that thou would draw very near to them. We'd also ask thee to remember wherever the gospel is going forth, wherever thy word is opened, the Lord Jesus presented as the only remedy for man's ruin, that thou will bless the preaching of the gospel with signs following, with the salvation of precious, never-dying souls. And what we pray for others, we pray especially for Ballykeel, that this would be a day of rejoicing when someone will get to know him whom to know is life eternal. We spread the need before thee, the great God of eternity, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask all in the precious, the worthy name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It's time to meet the country. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here. I'd just like to add to the welcome as well. Thank you for coming to listen to the message of the gospel, and that's whether you're in the hall or in the car park or listening later online. In addition to that, um, as we say around here, I'm a bit dosed, so uh, I'll trust you bear with me and have a bit of patience, and with God's help, we'll get through uh, this gospel meeting, and we trust it'll be a blessing to you. Uh, for our reading... Uh, if we could just turn to Psalm number 14, please. It's a very short psalm. It's the Psalm of David. But we'll only read half of it. Psalm number 14. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Please turn with me now to John chapter 18. John 18, and this is just after the Lord Jesus Christ has prayed in the garden. And he's about to be taken by his disciple that's betrayed him, Judas, and a band of men. And we'll just jump in at verse 3, John 18, verse 3. 
Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon as then he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Then asked he them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And we trust we have God's blessing upon the reading of his precious word. Well, it's linked these two scriptures in my mind is simply the idea of seeking. In Psalm 14, we have God, our heavenly Father, and he's looking down upon his creation, and he's looking at the children of men, and he's seeing if any of them seek him. And in John 18, we have the Lord Jesus Christ himself, and he goes and reveals himself to these band of men, to these uh, people that are seeking to crucify him and take him away. And he goes to them and he asks, Whom seek ye? Now, um, the idea of seeking, as and many of you well know, it's the idea of searching for, it's looking for. It's perhaps best explained by that parable of the lost sheep, where there's the shepherd and he has 100 sheep, and one goes missing. And the shepherd, he doesn't look at his flock of 99 and say, Well, I've got 99% of what I had, that's good enough. Or he doesn't spend around 10, 15 minutes looking around the fold and go, well, I can't find that one sheep, I'll just leave him there. No, the, good, the shepherd, he goes out and leaves those 99 sheep. He goes out into the wilderness to find that one sheep. And he doesn't get distracted. He doesn't turn aside. He goes and finds that one sheep and only returns to the 99 when that missing sheep is on his back and restored to the fold. That is the idea of seeking is that searching urgently, searching with a desire to find it. And it's that search which is, which is designed to try and to really find it. It's not a cursory glance. It's not just a thought. It's seeking that you may find. And if we go back to Psalm 14, we have the creator, God. And it's important to acknowledge that actually God is our creator. God is the one who's created the universe and everything therein. He's created the worlds, he created the stars by the might of his power, and he's also created us. He's created mankind. So if we look at Psalm 14 with that lens, we have the creator God, and he's looking down at his creation. And all he's looking for, he's saying, do any seek him? Do any search him? Do any look to him? And then we read that there was none. And that idea, that uh, thought is repeated again by Paul in Romans 3. Paul then takes that thought and he quotes again those words and says, as it is written, as it was written in Psalm 14, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They're all gone out of the way. They're all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. Friend, we have to acknowledge that. We have to acknowledge our state before God. We haven't sought him. We haven't sought his ways above ourselves. We've been seeking to do our own ways. The Bible would tell us we are sinners. We start in this world and we're far from him, far from what creation had planned for man, far from that man that had that fellowship with God before sin entered and ruined it all. You know, in the Garden of Eden, there was that beautiful uh, fellowship between God and man, that direct communication Sin entered and spoiled it all. And we are far from him. We are far from what we should be. We've sinned against God. We've not sought him. Perhaps you think, well, Andrew, I admit I don't seek God, but I certainly don't seek to go against God. I don't seek to do things which are contrary to him. Or I actually respect, you know, the gospel message or what you believe in Christianity or there's some that would say, well, I wouldn't but like, be like these band of men that sought to kill the Lord Jesus. They think maybe if I'm quite ambivalent to God or don't really take much to do with him, he won't take much to do with me. And it's that idea that they'll be safe enough 
if they're ambivalent or don't really consider him. But that's not the God we read about. You see, we read about a God, praise be, we read about a God that cares about his creation. We read about a God that I can proclaim to you, friend, that cares for each one of you, we, each one of you individually. You know, if we read Psalm 14 and we read about a God who was ignorant of his creation or a God who didn't really care, we would maybe stop at the end of Psalm 14 and see that idea of creation disobeying the creator and we could say, well, mankind should have been wiped out then. Or you could maybe go back to the garden where man had sinned and were removed from the garden and we could say, well, maybe mankind should have entered there. But friend, we have a God who is love. We have a God who cares about each one of you individually and we have a God, praise be, that desires to be with, desires you to be with him. He desires that relationship restored. You know, man, uh, there's these, what's the term, philosophers, atheist philosophers, and they look at mankind, and one of the famous one quotes and says, mankind is a throwaway survival machine. One who's destined to be born, to survive as long as he can, and then die. And that is the idea of mankind in their head, but friend, God has made you so much more. You are made in God's own image. You are known of God. It's a little truth we teach the Sunday school. He knows the very number of hairs on your head. He knows each one of you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made by him. And you've been given his breath of life. You are a living soul. You're designed for so much more than to live a little and then die. You're designed for eternity. So praise be, God cares about you. God wants you to be reconciled back to him. He wants that relationship between you and him restored to what it was. Two things I want to just really emphasize before I move on. First one, the creator cares about you, and that's a blessing. Number two, you've sinned against your creator. And since you've sinned against him, since you've done wrong in his sight, you must be punished for it. No sin, that's why mankind was taken out of the garden in the first place because of sin. You know too well the pains of sin. I'm sure you've experienced in your life how lies can begat more lies and cause pain and hurt or mistrust or, tho or those acts of selfishness and the disasters they can lead to. You know it, even in a little time on earth, no sin can ever dwell in heaven. Sin can never be in God's presence. So if you today hold on to your sin, and do not take Christ. You must go where sin must go. You must face the condemnation. You must face the wrath of God. You must face eternal punishment. But praise be, God cares about you and has provided a way you can be brought back to him. He's provided a way that you can be reconciled to him. And so through that, we see God's purposes in Christ made known. We turn to John 18 and perhaps... If we had more time or if we were, uh, or if we had a thought differently, we could look at these band of men and say, well, they're seeking Christ. They're seeking, uh, they're not ambivalent of God. In fact, they're worse, they're enemies, some would say. They're seeking to destroy Christ. But that's not what I want to point out here. It's actually verse four. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, whom seek ye. Now, we're not talking about seeking sinners here. We're talking about a seeking saviour. We're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, he knew full well what these band of men were looking for. He knew they were looking for him. He knew that when he went to them, they would take him and put him into that unjust trial, that they would take him and put him before Pilate, that he would be found guilty despite having no sin in him, that he would be taken to the, that he would be made to bear his cross, they would be taken up and crucified, and that upon his shoulders would be the sin of the world. Christ knew full well what he would experience when these band of men looking for, were looking for him. But why did he go there? It's the lovely words of Luke 19.10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. The Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ, God, and human flesh. He came and took up, put upon himself the form of a man. 
made himself a little lower than the angels, took upon him the form of a servant, and was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He, were, he allowed himself to be crucified for no sin of his own, but for the sin of all gathered here. The Son of Man is come to seek and to save. We would have to confess, if we, as we've already read, we've not sought God. We are not right in his sight. There is nothing we could do, say, or pay, as Jonathan said this morning, to earn our salvation. No, Christ did it all. Christ accomplished the fullness of salvation on the cross in Calvary. And only by his blood, only through his way, can we be reconciled back to God. Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. We were the lost ones. We were the ones who had fallen so far from the plan that God, uh, from the initial uh, desire for mankind. We had fallen so far from that beautiful vision. We had sinned against our creator, and yet God was the one who took the sacrifice. God is the one who has made all the effort to provide a way that you could be brought back to him. To wit, 2 Corinthians 5.19, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. He instead put those trespasses upon his only beloved son. He bore the wrath of God. He bore the condemnation of the sins that each of us here deserve. He took upon it on his own body. And friend, I can say personally to each of you today, he took upon himself your sin. God's purpose in Christ is made known. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is love. Friend, we have a seeking Savior. We have a Father who is seeking to restore you unto himself. And he desires, friend, for you to be saved. God, who would have all men to be saved and to come to knowledge of the truth. He has loved you with such a great love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God gave up his son for you. God gave up that which was most precious to him, that you could be brought back to him. God has provided the way. And now it falls to you. Will you seek him? Will you trust in the Christ, Christ as your saviour? Will you take him yourself and take that step and be saved for all eternity? You know, they say mankind seeks uh, some grand thing. They say, well, mankind should be seeking truth. Well, I can tell you about the word who became flesh and dwelt among us. The very truth of God, the very word came down and he dwelt among us and showed us that he was the way, the truth and the life. They say mankind desires love or companionship. Well, here is our saviour. As scripture would say there, what greater love hath any man than one who would lay down his life for his friends? Here is one who laid down his life for his enemies. Here is one who gave his own life, not for any crime he had committed, but for the sin of each of you here, myself included. So they say sometimes uh, mankind is searching for meaning, something grander than life itself. Well, you can only have that when you consider our eternal God. You can consider the us, his creation, mankind made in his own image, enjoying fellowship with God, enjoying being in his presence, to enjoy God forever, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That is the grand purpose of man, and that can be only met if you are brought back to him in Christ. One last point, and I'll be quick. Isaiah 55, 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him, while he is near, you know, there's an urgency with the gospel message. Christ died for you, yes, and he rose. You know, people say they're looking for this great sign of God to say that he exists. Well, this is your sign. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The word of God which proclaims of him is written for our benefit that we can see him as the one whom God has sent to deal with our sin and that he is risen. And as he rose, those who trust in him will rise likewise. And he's ascended. He's seated at the right hand of God. And one day, don't know which day, don't know how far along, he will, he will return 
and take his waiting people home. There is a day coming where the end of the gospel end, age, as it's called, will end. There'll be no more one for Christ. There'll be no more gospel meetings. There'll be no more opportunities, no more another time. There'll be the last time and believers will be taken with them. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. There's a time coming, there's urgency. There'll be no room for ambivalence there. There'll be no room for indecision there. You'll either be saved, you'll either be lost. Friend, I trust that you will trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I trust that you will take him for yourself and beg of you just to consider these eternal matters, to consider your latter end and consider what all God has given that you could be brought back to him. Now it falls to you. What will you do with Jesus, which is called Christ? Very simply, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Take that step today and you'll be saved. You know heaven as your home. You know the joy of Christ, and you'll be with him in all eternity. So we just bow together in prayer. Our Father, we give thee thanks again for another opportunity to present the gospel, another opportunity to learn again of our Lord Jesus Christ, to learn that thou hast indeed provided a way that we can be reconciled back to thee, that relationship restored. And we praise thee for thy grace and mercy in ever sending thy son. And now it falls to the listener. What will they do with Jesus, which is called Christ? Father, we pray and ask that thou would be working in the hearts of many today, of all listening, that they would take that step, that they would trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that they would serve him as their very own Lord, and that they indeed would be made ready for heaven. Father, we praise thee for the simplicity of the gospel. We pray and ask earnestly, Father, that this would be a day of salvation. That any of those who are considering Christ, that they would just go all the way. Trust him as their saviour. Be saved for eternity. Father, we praise thee for a seeking saviour. We praise thee that thou art even speaking today in the gospel message. Another opportunity we have, and it's by thy mercy. But Father, we do not know how many more opportunities we have. Father, we ask that this day, uh, anyone listening who has not trusted thee would be saved that they would take that step, trusting Jesus as their own. Father, we leave the meeting with thee and ask for uh, safety as we return to our homes, asking you to bless this food which has been provided. Bless each of us as we would gather here and enjoy fellowship with one another. We ask for thy blessing and uh, covet thy care. We give thee thanks again for thy son in the worthy and precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much for listening. We'll just sing the last hymn on our sheet. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. It speaks about the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross, just what he suffered in our stead, that we would be one and restored back to God. Uh, we'll, sing the, we'll just remain seated and sing the entire hymn. Thank you for listening. Spent in vanity and pride. Yeah.